Hey everyone, welcome to the Frontline Community Church Podcast. My name is Carol Ann Flood, and I'm the worship director here at Frontline in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Our mission is simple, to see zero people unchanged by Jesus. So whether you've been following Jesus your whole life, or your journey has just begun, we hope that this message will help you draw near to the person of Jesus, be challenged and encouraged by His Word, and be moved to action. We hope these next few moments are a blessing to you and equip you to see who God really is and who you are in Him. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. If you're joining with us online, it's great to have you with us as well. Uh, Man, what an incredible week last week. Um, Believe it or not, we saw well over 30 people uh, go public with their faith in Jesus through baptism across the four churches of our Zero Collective Church, many of those right here at Frontline. And so we're just celebrating with you. If that was you, if you got baptized or if you had a family member get baptized, we've been praying for you by name this past week. And uh, we're just excited uh, for where we're headed. As we're, we're in this series right now, um, since January, we've been looking at the big story of the Bible. And ever since uh, the season of Lent began, we've been kind of turning our gaze toward the cross. And so we've talked about how Jesus redeemed us. Uh, by his work on the cross. And so today, uh, three weeks away till Easter, we are now kind of entering the last and and final part of this series where we're talking about how the resurrection has actually begun the process of restoration. That uh, Jesus, when he rose from the grave, that began the process of us being moved toward heaven, toward our eternal home, toward the picture of uh, what God wants for all of us to be restored um, into the picture of, of heaven. And so that's what we're going to begin looking at today and in the weeks as we head up and then celebrate the resurrection on Easter Sunday morning. Um, so I'll introduce uh, our concept today with this way. Um, when I was a really little, little kid, in fact, an infant, somebody, I don't even know who, gave me a stuffed teddy bear. It looked something like this. This isn't, isn't the actual bear, but this was, it, it looked like this, had this nice white fur. It looked really good. It was, it was plush. And so I had this, uh, you know, teddy bear from the time I was a kid. And as I grew up and I became a toddler, my mom said this bear became like my favorite stuffed animal. It went with me everywhere. Like you would not see me and not see that bear. I drug it with me everywhere. And so uh, as I began to become like a, a young kid, this bear got really nasty. Like it just, like the neck got all stretched out. You know, one of the eyes fell off. The ears were like ripped off and the fur didn't even look white anymore. It was like matted down and brown and smelled bad. And so my mom literally, at a, I don't know what age I was, but at a certain point she just decided it's time for him to give up that bear. And of course I didn't want to, as a little kid, I didn't want to give up the bear. And so what happened was uh, we were driving home from somewhere and I fell asleep in the back seat of the car and I had the, you know, the bear was right there on the, on the seat. So when we got home, my mom saw her opportunity and took advantage of it. She grabbed the bear and she hid it. And so then when I woke up, uh, she just said, I don't know what happened to your bear. You must have lost it. And so well, she said that literally for like two weeks, I cried and cried. I missed this bear terribly. Uh, you know, I, I went around the house like looking for it and crying. And so um, after a couple of weeks, I, I did exactly what every kid does, right? I grew up and I forgot about it. I just kind of moved on. So a few years pass. I'm now like an older kid. And one day my mom is cleaning out boxes, you know, in the attic of old stuff. And she finds this bear. She finds this old bear. She had taken it, hidden it, and thrown it in this box at some point. And so she calls me and she says, Brian, Brian, she calls me in and she tells me what she did. And uh, I'm really working through that in therapy. I'm hoping that this is the year. (laughs) Mom, I'm hoping I'm going to be able to forgive you this year uh, for that. You know, finally think it's time. (laughs) But she tells me, I took this bear. This is your bear. And she holds up this bear. And it literally looks like this. And I have this memory. This is the, I have this memory of looking at this bear as an older kid. and, And the thought that went through my head was, this is the thing that I was like clinging to. This is the thing that I drug around with me everywhere. This is, the, this is what I cried about for two weeks. It's funny how maturity and, and time, you look back and you realize the things that you loved maybe weren't as beautiful as you thought they were. The reason I tell you this is because I wonder if that's what heaven is gonna be like. I wonder if when we get to heaven, we will look at our earthly pleasures Uh, you know, the things that we cling to here, our worldly possessions, our worldly relationships. I wonder if we will 
look at those things from the perspective of heaven, kind of like I looked at that teddy bear years later, like, really? That, that's what I was so into? That's what I was clinging to? That was it? Uh, we're looking at the picture of heaven. And so um, we began this whole series in the first couple of chapters of the book of Genesis. If you were with us in January, we looked at the way we were created, the way we were originally designed. And so we started in those first two chapters of the Bible. We're gonna end this series looking at the final two chapters of the Bible, the place where the story ends. Revelation 21 and 22 are where we see the final picture of our eternal home in heaven. So let's look at that description together. This is uh, Revelation 21, 1 through 4 is our text for today. And so it says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. That's the picture we're given of heaven. So, so it's a picture, the story began in a garden, if you remember, in the first couple of chapters of Genesis, and the story ends in a city, a new Jerusalem, in a new heaven, and a new earth. Um, now, I don't know if, if you're anything like me. Uh, when you read those verses, I don't know what it stirs up inside of you. Uh, for me, when I read those verses, uh, there are certain things that I can just immediately rejoice about, right? No more death, no more crying, no more, no more pain. I can celebrate that. I can get excited about, you know, no more curse, the curse being done away with. Um, mosquitoes, anybody? <laughs> no more mosquitoes? That sounds amazing. Uh, but then there are these other things in these verses. Um, no more sea? I don't know. I love the ocean. Anybody else like the beach? I love the ocean. There's no more sea? Um, no more sun? After completing my 21st winter in West Michigan, <laughs> I love the sun. I need the sun. My white, pale skin has been devoid of sun for so long. Anybody else? Like, I love the sun. When you read some of this, it's kind of like, wait, wait a minute. And then you think about some of the other earthly pleasures that we have that our physical human experience allows us. What, what about food? What about sex? I'm a man, so maybe those are the first two things I think of. But uh, what, what, about, um, what about art? What about great art? What about nature? Right? I mean, the story ends in a city. So like urban planning, that's the thing we're supposed to be excited about? That's what we're supposed to get? Have you ever read some of these pictures, some of these images of heaven, and you just find yourself kind of going, oh, well, that sounds amazing, but uh, I don't know. I'm not so sure about any, some of these other things. The reason that we do that, the reason that we think that way is because our thinking is backwards. Our, our thinking is, is reversed. What we have to understand is that when we're given these pictures of heaven in scripture, what it's trying to get us to understand is that it, it's our earthly pleasures, the things that we cherish here, the things that we cling to here, those things are meant to give us a foretaste. Those things are appetizers, food and sex and March Madness basketball. Those things all are supposed to be like an appetizer, a foretaste, pointing us to real pleasure. In God, in eternity, we will experience pleasures that put our earthly pleasures to shame. We will be looking back, kind of like I look back at that teddy bear and, and we'll literally just be like, are you, are you kidding me? That's what I thought was so amazing. That's what I was clinging to. This is the thing I cried and cried over that I was gonna have to leave behind. That's how we'll feel. Because everything amazing that we experience here on this earth simply points us to and is meant to just kind of whet our appetite for the real thing, the true thing, which is only found in God. It's only found in him. And that's what I, and so inside of all of us, we have this longing, whether we realize it or not, we're looking to satisfy it all the time but by earthly pleasures, but that longing can only ultimately be satisfied in this eternal home that we were made for somewhere better. We were made for something better. 
So this is the picture we're given in, in Revelation 21 and 2 and in Isaiah 65 and 66 in the Old Testament or where you, you find in the, in the Bible some of these pictures of heaven. We find that God is making things new again. Go ahead to the next one. Creation starting over. We see the curse done away with. And we see a restored relationship with God and humans. Literally, and we'll get to this in, in future weeks, it talks about Eden being restored. The Garden of Eden, paradise, is actually restored. And so everything that we experience here is just a hint. It's pointing us to that ultimate experience in heaven, but we aren't there yet. And all you have to do is look around our world, look around it at the suffering that's happening in our world right now, coming out of two years of a pandemic, and it's not hard to figure out we ain't there yet. We're not experiencing it yet. And so when you look at the Bible, what you have to understand is that the resurrection is actually the hinge point of human history. The, the resurrection, when it's introduced in the Bible, it is the event, it is the most important event in human history because it is, it is the moment where our future is ushered into our present. It's the moment where our, our future meets our present and we experience uh, the future that we're supposed to move toward. If there is no resurrection, there is no future. There is no eschatology. It's a big word that just means the study of future things. If there is no resurrection, then this is all there is. But just because the resurrection has happened does not mean that we are there yet. It doesn't mean that our world has been restored and that we're living in heaven yet. So I want to give you uh, maybe a, a framework that you haven't heard before. Maybe some of you have. Uh, but scholars and thinkers refer to this idea in Scripture as the already and not yet of the kingdom of God. That's the phrase, already and not yet. And so if I could, this is kind of like, if you remember in school, this is kind of like a Venn diagram, if you remember those. And so uh, to kind of explain what this is like and what the scriptures talk about, the blue line here represents this age, okay? The age that we live in right now. The yellow line represents the age to come. It represents heaven. It represents eternity. So the moment that the age to come broke into our age right now, was at the first coming of Christ, at the outpouring of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and at the resurrection of Christ. Those events ushered in what we would think of as heaven in the age to come. And yet, we're still in this age. This age is not completed until the second coming of Christ, when Jesus is going to return, and the general resurrection of the dead, that we're all raised to eternal life. So we live, I can kind of explain it, we live right here. This is where we live. We live in what's called the already and not yet. Jesus has already come. His kingdom has already been ushered in, and yet we're not there yet. Things are still broken. Things are still a mess. And all throughout the New Testament, you see expressions of this. Let me give you one. I'll give you an example. In 1 Corinthians 15, the writer Paul is describing the resurrection. He's talking about the resurrection, and what he says is he says, death has lost its sting. So it's this powerful statement. He says, death has lost its sting. So what he's saying there is he's saying, look, death is still here. Every single one of us in this room and every single one of us watching online, we are all going to die at some point. Our physical bodies were not meant to last. We will, our bodies will eventually wear out. Every single one of us will eventually die. And yet, because of the resurrection, death has lost its sting. The sting has been taken out of death. So even though it's here, we're, it, it's already, but it's not yet. We, we still have to experience death, but the, the ultimate sting of death has been taken out by the resurrection, has been taken out by the hope that we have in Christ. Now, why did I just take the time to tell you all of that? <laughs> why did I just take so much time explaining this you know, theological concept to you and trying to get you to understand it? And the reason is because I think it's one of the most important things that any Christian can possibly understand is that we are living right now in the already but not yet of the kingdom of God. Here is why it matters so much. Here's why I want you to understand it as we look at the Bible. It's because knowing the gospel is the only thing that will set you free in the midst of your current trials. If it's true that what we're living in right now is this time, that already and not yet, where Jesus has come but things are still a mess, then really, knowing the gospel, embracing the gospel is the only thing that has the power to actually liberate you and set you free in the midst of your trials right now. Let me illustrate it this way. Uh, there's a guy named Murdo McDonald. He was a Scottish uh, minister who was taken captive by the Nazis during World War II. 
doesn't that just sound like a great Scottish Highlands name? Like Murdo McDonald, that's his name. So he writes about his experience where he was taken captive by the Nazis and he was put in a prison camp. And in this prison camp, there was an American side of the prison camp and there was a, uh, a British side to the, to the prison camp and there were German guards there. And so Murdo McDonald, because he was a Scottish chaplain, he becomes the, the chaplain for, he begins to serve as the chaplain for the American side. Now on the British side, uh, of this prison camp, there was another Highland Scott, and they both knew each other, and he became like the, the chaplain for the British side. Now, there was a fence that divided the American side and the British side in the prison camp. And so every day, Murdo McDonald would go down to this fence, and he would meet his counterpart, his, this other Scottish chaplain, and the two of them would t- speak to one another in Gaelic, and they would pass messages between each other in Gaelic. Now, the reason they would do this is because the German guards understood German, of course, and they also understood French and they understood English, but they did not speak Gaelic. So they were free to kind of converse and talk to each other and share messages. And Murdo MacDonald had managed to get some contraband on his side. What he had hidden from the guards, he had a shortwave radio that he had managed to keep a secret. And every day he would listen to this shortwave radio and he would listen for the news that was happening with the war. So one day, literally, he's listening to this shortwave radio in this prison camp, and the news comes across the radio, Germany has surrendered. Germany surrendered. The war is over. But of course, the German guards didn't know this because all communication had broken down at that point. And so he very quickly, he rushes out, you know, moving quickly to the fence, and he meets this Scottish chaplain, and he shares the news, Germany surrendered. The war is over. And and he tells the story of how he watches this Scottish chaplain, his friend, turn and walk back into the British barracks. And within like a minute later, there's just this explosion of cheering and clapping and uh, everybody just going crazy. These are his words. This is what he says. He says this, for the next three days, we were still prisoners. The guards still pointed guns at us, but we walked around as if we were free men with smiles on our faces. We didn't complain about the food anymore. We didn't hate the guards anymore. We actually felt sorry for them. On the fourth day, the guards were gone. They had gotten the news and opened the gates. Listen to this line. I love this line. Here's what he ends with. But we had already been liberated when we heard the news. Do you see it? That's us. That's you and I, my friends. We were liberated from this world the moment that we heard the gospel news. So you may be walking around in the prison camp of this life still right now. You may be dealing with all manner of suffering, all manner of sickness, all manner of disease, all manner of relational brokenness, whatever it is. But you were set free the moment, you were liberated the moment you heard the gospel message. Let let me take this a little bit further. Let me, let me explain it to you a little bit more. Why in the world do we here in church, why do we get involved in issues of poverty and injustice? Have you ever wondered that? Why is that a thing that, that people in church do? Why do we get involved in things like hand to hand? It's a ministry at all four of our churches in the, in the Zero Collective that helps you know at-risk kids during the weekend. Why do we give to that? Why do we help with that? Why is there a team from the Zero Collective that is going in May to Guatemala to establish a new partnership there? Why do we sponsor kids in Ukro, Ethiopia? Why do we do scent events? Why do we get involved in issues of poverty and injustice in our world? Do we do that because we think if we do that, somehow we're gonna fix poverty and injustice? Absolutely not. In fact, Jesus said, the poor you're always gonna have with you until the moment I return. So why do we get involved in issues of poverty and injustice if we know we can't fix it? We get involved as the church in issues of poverty and injustice because we know those things have already breathed their last. We know the good news. We're living in the future reality. Why do we come in here every single Sunday? Every single Sunday, have you noticed? And we sing these songs We sing about the goodness of God. We just sang about it a few minutes ago. Why do we come in here and sing songs about how good God is when every single one of you knows, every single one of you here in this room and watching online knows that we still have cancer. We still have war. Russia is still invading Ukraine right now. Uh, We still have, you know, relational brokenness. 
People, we still have death. Those things are, are still happening in our world. Why in the world do we come in here and sing songs about how good God is? Is it because we think if we just sing loud enough, somehow it's gonna fix those things? No, we come in here every single Sunday and we sing songs about the goodness of God because we know those things have breathed their last. War, cancer, sex trafficking that happens here in the city of Grand Rapids, those things have breathed their last because of the resurrection. Like Maya Angelou said, we know why the caged bird still sings because the cage is temporary. You were liberated the moment you heard the good news. The moment you heard it, it sets you free from this world. So the only question then that's remaining, and I will tell you, every single Christian who has understood the concept I just explained has asked this question at some point in time. The only question that's remaining is, right? Why doesn't God hurry up? During COVID, I was sent emails by some of you. At literally, that was your question. Why isn't he back yet? What's going on? If there's, we, we see the suffering in our world. We see pain. We see war. We see pandemics and disease and cancer. We see these things. What is God waiting on? What is Jesus waiting on? Why doesn't he hurry up? Why doesn't he end the suffering? If we already know the, the future, if we already know the good news, what, what is he waiting on? And I would tell you that the New Testament, the biblical answer to that, what the Bible tells us is, is what he's waiting on is he is searching. The father is still searching. Who's he searching for? He's searching for his lost children. Well, how long is he gonna search for? I don't know. How long would you search? How long would you search for one of your lost kids? This is 2 Peter 3, 9. Peter is answering this very question. He's talking about the second coming of Christ. And he's trying to get people to understand. They're wondering, why hasn't Jesus come back yet? Because they were under persecution. And this is what he says. The Lord, in verse 9, he says, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. You see, now we get to kind of the double-edged sword of the picture of heaven. You know, we, we get to, you know, the reality of the new creation, the hard reality, I would say, of the new creation, of, of the new heaven and the new earth. And the hard reality is that you're either going to be a part of it, you're going to be a part of creation being made new, or you're not. You're going to be either one of the people who have repented of their sin and become aware of their need and ask Jesus to be the Lord and to save them, or you're not. And so, you know, in God's perspective, we, we lose track of this all the time. In God's perspective, you, when God looks at humanity, there are only two groups of people. That's it. There's only two categories. We create all these categories, right? Right? In God's mind, there's only two groups. There, in God's mind, there are not Democrats and Republicans and, uh, you know, Americans and Russians and, and Wesleyans and Baptists and Pentecostals and, you know, Presbyterians. In God's mind, there are only, from his perspective, there's only two groups of people. There are those who are, being, who are repenting and being saved for their eternal home, and there are those who are lost. Those are the two categories. Jesus in Matthew 25 calls them the sheep and the goats. Those are the only two categories of people. You're either in one or in your other. So what's God waiting on? Why is Jesus taking so long? It's actually because of his love. He's not being slow. He's being patient, Peter says, because he doesn't want that anyone would not come to a place of repentance. Do you guys know why we do three services for Easter? Uh, it's actually a lot of work. It's actually a giant pain in the butt, if I'm being honest. It creates endless meetings and plans. And do you know why we do that every year? Why we make more room for more people? Do you know why our staff every week works really hard 
to make this the kind of place that lost people would feel welcomed into and lost people would feel welcome to come to. You know why we do that? Do you know why right now we are looking to expand the Zero Collective Network and add more churches and continue to, to kind of grow and, and move to more people? It's actually not an organizational reason. It's actually, for me, it's a very personal reason why we do those things. The reason is because I know that every single one of you, every single one of you watching online as well, and every single person in every all four churches in the Zero Collective know someone. Someone who is close to you, but they are far from God. And that, that used to be my family. That used to be me. That used to be our family. And so this gets personal for me. Uh, a criticism that I have gotten um, all the years that I've, I've been in ministry is if there's one criticism that has uh, come back again and again to me, um, I heard it when we first moved into this building that was way too big for us at the time. Uh, when we continue to expand the ministry and hire more staff, I heard it again. And to be very honest with you, even since announcing um, this uh, transition and moving into this new role with the Zero Collective to continue to expand things, I've heard it again. Uh, and so here's the criticism. Here, here's the way it goes. It sounds like this. Brian, all you care about is numbers. All, you just care about numbers, meaning like numbers of people coming, uh, numbers of people getting saved, numbers of people writing their names on a Jesus banner that's out there in the lobby, you've seen it. Numbers of people coming out of the waters of baptism like we saw last week. All you care about is numbers. Can I just tell you if that's you? You don't scare me at all. You've never scared me. In fact, I... <laughs> In fact, I'll take you on right now. The reason I'm not scared of you is because I know that every single one of those numbers is a life that matters to God and that Jesus died for. And, it, and it's what he's waiting on. It's what he's hindering. It's, it's what hinders him from coming back right now and ending all suffering and all death in this world right now. People, people. And I can tell you this, when it is your brother, when it is your sister, when it's your child, when it's your friend, when it's your neighbor, when it's your co-worker, when, it, when it's that person in your life who you've invested in, when they are the ones that come out of the waters of baptism, when they are the ones that write their names on the Jesus banner, I can promise you, you will care about that number. I won't have to argue you about it. I won't have to convince you, you will care. We should care about this. Can I just say, we, as the church, we should care more about this than we do. And so we do these things, like we, we make these, um, you're probably sitting on it, Blake just talked about it earlier. We make these cards and we put them on your seats. Uh, and, and man, these, these are awesome cards. We, we spent money on these. And so you've got to, I hope every single one of you are gonna take this card with you as you walk out of this place today. But can I just tell you, these cards aren't for you. Look on the back. If you're sitting here in this room, there's a map on the back. You already apparently know where this place is. <laughs> you got here this morning somehow. You found it online somehow. That information's here too. It's not for you. So much of what the church is really about is not for us. We are the church and we exist for the world to know Jesus. So who do you know that is close to you, far from God, who, who are you going to extend an invite to? You have three weeks, three weeks till Easter. And uh, man, the celebration that we experience when people are lost and they are found is not just experienced by us. It's experienced by all of heaven. And that's something we get to do together. So I just would love to offer a prayer if, you'd if you can bow with me. Jesus, we just bow before you right now. First and foremost, uh, thank you, Jesus, that you went to the cross, that you rose from the grave, 
and that eternal life is ours today. The cage is temporary. We were liberated the moment that we heard the good news. And we thank you, God, that that liberation, that freedom is available to every single human being uh, who hears the sound of your voice and responds to you. And, and so, Jesus, we know you are a, a good father. You're a heavenly father who is looking for his children. And uh, so, God, would you give us eyes to see? Would you give us a burden, God? Weird to ask for, but I ask for it. Would you give each of us a burden for someone we know, uh, God, somebody who we interact with, somebody who we are in relational context with? Uh, God, we make no apologies. We are about seeing people coming into the kingdom. That's what we want. And I believe that's what's going to matter in all of eternity. It's what we'll be celebrating and singing about someday on the other side. The things that are so important to us right now, so much of the times, the, the distractions are going to look like that ragged, tattered teddy bear when we get to heaven. Like, really? That's what I was living for? That's what I thought was so important? We don't want to be that, God. We want to be those who are caught up in the glory of your kingdom and what you're doing. So to that end, God, would you do it? We ask in Jesus' name. And everybody said... We hope this message encouraged you in seeing who God is and who you are in Him. If you want to take a next step, visit frontlinegr.com forward slash connect. We look forward to connecting with you there, and we'll see you back here next week.